Hi, my name is Kate Sullivan and I'm coming to you today on behalf of the Medical Advisory Board of the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Today is June 18th. We are at day 100 of the COVID-19 pandemic. The title of today's talk is COVID-19 for antibody geeks. And that is a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's also meant to signal that this is a different talk. This is really technical. There's not going to be any clinical guidance, no recommendations. This is really to answer some questions that we've been getting at the Immune Deficiency Foundation and I've certainly had from patients, friends, and neighbors. So there will be three questions that I'm going to try and address today. One is, are all antibodies good? Number two is, what's so hard about making a vaccine? Just give it and make some antibodies. Why can't we? And number three is, is there a difference between antibodies that are generated to a vaccine and antibodies that are generated to a natural infection? Certainly all relevant questions, but they do require some technical discussion. So I'm going to start by just reminding you that there are five isotypes of antibody. IgG, IgA, IgM, and IgE. And then there's IgD, which we seldom talk about. Now, these antibodies, in addition to having different structures, also have slightly different functions. Today, I'm going to focus on IgG. Most vaccines are meant to induce an IgG response. And so, although I will give passing mention to some of the others, this is really focused on IgG. Now, at the same time, we have to get familiar with the virus because I'm going to be talking about some components of the virus. And in this little cartoon diagram, I've taken the virus and cut it in cross-section. The interior is comprised of nucleoproteins and RNA. You can think of this interior as being sort of the virus version of chromosomes. This is the material that allows the virus to reproduce itself. And because it is invisible to B cells, the white cells that go on to make antibody, I'm not going to talk about the interior anymore. I'm gonna focus on the surface characteristics of the virus because those are the components that we make antibody to. Now, coronaviruses are named because they were thought to look a little bit like a crown or a tiara when they were seen on edge. And those protrusions that people saw in early microscopy were actually these spike proteins. So the orange triangles that are sticking out are meant to represent the spike protein. It's actually the largest protein on the surface of the virus. There are other proteins, membrane proteins, small membrane proteins. There's a protein called hemagglutinin esterase. All of these proteins do induce some antibody response because they're on the surface they're accessible to the B cells, and so antibodies can be generated to them. Now you'll also notice that there's a solid blue line. That's the surface of the virus. That is made of lipid. You may remember way back at the beginning of COVID-19 when people were talking about washing your hands and they were saying you need to wash with soap and water for 20 seconds. It's because the soap disrupts this lipid membrane. So lipid is another word for sort of buttery, fatty things. And so what is soap really good at? It's really good at disrupting that lipid component of the virus. So that is how the soap works. Well, I talked about five different isotypes of virus as well as the IgG subclasses. And now we've got all these different proteins. So you can definitely imagine that there is a wealth of antibodies produced and they're all a bit different. Actually, that only scratches the surface. So I've tried to sort of schematically describe the diversity in this little diagram, but the diversity goes even beyond this. So over time, antibodies get smarter. So during the course of a natural infection, the antibodies train themselves up. So they get smarter over time. The B cells sort of weed out the ones that are less effective and start producing more and more of the antibodies that bind tighter. So that happens over time. It happens a little bit with vaccine, but that's one of the things that are different between a natural infection and a vaccine. It takes time for these antibodies to train themselves up, and so only with repeated exposures or a prolonged exposure can the antibodies get smarter and bind better. 
and there's even more. So I made it sound like you make an antibody to spike or an antibody to small membrane protein. Of course, these proteins are quite large and you can make antibodies to different regions of that. I will show you that in a minute when I get to the three-dimensional model. So before I get to the model, let me just stop and say why we think antibodies might be a wonderful thing to have in SARS-CoV-2 infections. So there's a little bit of data, not much, but you have heard people donating convalescent plasma. So this is when people have had COVID-19, recovered from it, and are presumed to have antibodies that are helpful. They generously go in to donate their plasma, that plasma is purified and then given to someone who's very sick, who's really struggling with the virus. And there are data now that have been published that demonstrate that it is effective. It's not like a light switch, but it does seem to help people get better faster. So we think that having antibodies are a good thing in the acute infection. And we know from other vaccines that making an IgG to some infecting organism generally protects you from getting reinfected with that. What else do we know? Well, in SARS-CoV-2 specifically, we know that you can start seeing antibodies at about a week into the infection, and they peak at about three weeks into the infection. And then at least with another coronavirus, those antibodies are known to decline slowly over about two years. The antibodies do not seem to last lifelong. And the other thing that we know, unfortunately, is that the sicker you are with the infection, the more antibodies you make. And that is generally true with natural infections. The longer the infection lasts, the more the burden of whatever the pathogen is, the more antibodies will get made to it. It seems really quite unfair, but in fact, it's, it's generally true that the sicker you are with an infection, the more antibody you will make. This is my three-dimensional model of SARS-CoV-2. I know it's not quite National Geographic quality, but we are still in the yellow zone, and so I do not have access to any stores. This is what I could manage, so let's work with what we've got. So you can imagine this is the virus that I showed you before in two dimensions, now in three dimensions. And these protrusions are meant to represent the spike protein, and I've actually ignored the other proteins for the moment. And why is that? So I mentioned that antibodies to spike are thought to be particularly important, and here is why. I'm using this K cup to represent the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. This is the receptor that recognizes the spike protein. So in nature, the virus would latch onto that ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 protein, on the surface of the cell. So imagine that this table is the surface of the cell. These receptors would bind the spike protein, and that's the mechanism by which the virus gains entry into our cells. Now these receptors are expressed both in the respiratory tract and the gastrointestinal tract, and those are the two parts of the body that are primarily infected with the virus. So why would antibodies to spike protein be important? Well, you can imagine that you could have an antibody, and remember there are two ends to antibody. This is the binding end, that's what my clothespin is meant to represent, the part that binds the pathogen and recognizes the spike protein, and then there's this other end, and this is what can engage with cells and signal them that there's a protein. So this end is just as important, and it's this end that differs between IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, and IgD. So we have an anti-spike antibody here. You can imagine it recognizes the tip and binds right there. We'll put on a couple of more. And so you can appreciate, I think, better now in this model that the antibodies binding to the spike protein would mean that the virus can't gain entry into the cell. It's occluded. You can think of these antibodies as being like sharp elbows that prevent the virus from gaining entry into the cell. Now, they don't have to be just like this with the antibodies directly binding to the tip and actually occluding the interaction with the receptor here. 
you can imagine that even having antibodies that bind to the side of this spike could impair the ability of the virus to get into the cell. Those are called neutralizing antibodies, and neutralizing antibodies are always beneficial. And so making neutralizing antibodies to spike protein is the goal of most of the vaccines because we think, at least in a test tube, that those are the antibodies that are most important in preventing infection. So I think it's important to recognize this three-dimensional aspect. I want to just start answering the questions now that I've given all this orientation. And the first question we wanted to address is, are all antibodies good? I'm actually going to answer that in two ways. So you are probably aware that some people have allergies. They make IgE to pollen or even they could make IgE to different foods. That's harmful if you make IgE to pollen or to food. You're allergic to it, and that's unpleasant at best and um, actually life-threatening at worst. It's not all about IgE, though, so you can make IgG to your own self-proteins. But these are disease conditions. So when you make IgG to your red cells, that causes hemolytic anemia. You can make IgG to your nerve cells. But those are all medical conditions. Are there natural antibodies that don't cause disease that aren't helpful? And that is actually the crux of the second question. So the second question was, why can't we just make a vaccine? For heaven's sakes, Pasteur did it in the 1800s. Why can't we just make a vaccine and be done with it and move on? So here is why. And for this part, I'm going to introduce you to this little toy. Um, these toys were developed by an immunologist in Peru named Juan Carlos Aldave, and he has a whole series of these. Now, this is not the right size. To be the right size for this virus, this cell would have to be the size of my room. But it's what I have, and so we're going to talk about it. Now, this is a macrophage, and one of the problems that has happened with other vaccines is antibodies were generated as a result of a vaccine, and then when the real infection happened, it was more severe than if they hadn't been vaccinated. That's called antibody-dependent enhancement. And let's take a look at it because it was described for one vaccine that was generated to the previous SARS virus, the one that had a more limited outbreak some years ago. So what is antibody-dependent enhancement? So imagine you have made these antibodies to spike protein. You think for all the world that everything is going great. But in the setting of a natural virus infection after vaccination, it turns out that some of these antibodies are bound by the macrophage. And so those antibodies act like a sponge to bring the virus into the cell. So all of a sudden, instead of blocking entry, this other end is being recognized by the macrophage, and the macrophage is soaking up all of this virus and actually facilitating infection through this mechanism. So it doesn't happen with every vaccine, clearly, and it doesn't happen in every person that gets the vaccine. There's something very special about antibody-dependent enhancement. It's been very widely studied, and it is a real problem. So it happened to a virus um, vaccine that was developed in the 1960s, an RSV vaccine, and then it was observed to happen with a dengue vaccine, and then the SARS vaccine that was developed some years ago for the other SARS virus. So it can happen. It doesn't generally happen, but it can happen. And because it happened to a previous SARS virus, there's definitely concern that we have to be careful and make sure it's not happening with any of the current vaccines that are being developed. And the last question is, does a vaccine generate antibodies that are as good as a natural infection? So, of course, we won't know until the specific vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 is rolled out, but there are examples where vaccines actually induce better immunity than natural infection. So a good example of this is pneumococcus. In a natural infection, pneumococcus does not engender much antibody at all. But with the vaccine, we tend to make quite high levels of antibody. So it's different. So mumps is on the other side of the equation. The mumps vaccine generates antibody that is less durable than a natural infection. So it can happen either way in terms of durability. 
and you just have to try the vaccine and monitor it. There's not a great way to predict ahead of time. So what about the quality of the antibody? So we've touched on that with antibody dependent enhancement. Is there something about the quality of the antibody that would be different with a vaccination? So I've mentioned that the antibodies that we think we need are antibodies to spike protein, but in a natural infection, you would generate antibodies to the spike protein, the membrane protein, the small membrane protein, to the hemagglutinin and esterase. Anything on the surface is capable of inducing an antibody response. Some vaccines that are in trial, and at the end I will give you a resource that describes all 138 vaccines that are in development right now. Some of the vaccines in development are whole virus, they're whole inactivated virus, in which case you would expect to see a diversity of antibodies just like in a natural infection. Some of the vaccines in development are just the spike protein, in which case you're not going to make the same diversity. All of the antibody will be generated to the spike protein, which again is what we think we need. And then there are uh, vaccines in development that, are, that have more or less of the vaccine in them. Maybe not single component, but not the whole virus. So that's going to dictate the diversity of the antibody response. So that is it for the Antibodies for Geeks session. I hope this has been interesting and useful to you. I will end by saying that on day 100 of the pandemic, I think that everyone has felt all 100 days. It has been a very difficult time for everyone. I will say that there is a little ray of hope. I have never seen science move more quickly, and I have never seen scientists and clinicians be more willing to share what they've learned, share what they're doing, and try and help others battle this very serious foe that we're facing. And so while vaccines may or may not be helpful to individual immune deficient patients, on a population basis, a vaccine is unquestionably the way to keep this infection suppressed around the world. And so I am encouraged to see all of this cooperation and to see the urgency with which people are addressing it. So I will leave you with that positive thought, and as always, be safe, be strong.